Hi there. Welcome to our Dyson Dungeons painting stream. Uh, today we're having a little more of a quiet day. I'm not down in the workshop. I am going to be working up here in our doing some digital work because I didn't really get any sleep last night. So I'm kind of tired and as such, I want it to be wrapped up and cozy in a blanket and have a slow, easy morning. And so we're going to be working on our art today. So, just get that thingy set up so I can see what I want to set. <laughs> Make sure everything is down. And then we'll get right into it. in all of the rough of all the colors that we were going to use. Um, and now the last, well, the last time we worked on this specific. Uh, and now that those are in, we're just going through and getting everything part of worked in. Getting all of the belt. Always a little. There's a lot of them in here. We're just gonna have a nice slow vibe. Okay with that. But it is relaxing.
even the puppies are tired this morning. One nice thing so far. Coffee to the Bye. Uh, well, uh, I'm. This is Photoshop. I still have my college account, so we could get it considerably cheaper than normal. If you have a .edu address, uh, email address. Um, even if you're not actually attending college, you can usually get a reasonable discount on Photoshop products. And we we use the full suite for a variety of things. Um, but there are other um, Photoshop-like services that are quite good. Uh, You don't need to do a flip. Here, let me let me zoom it out. All right, here we go. Here's the flip. 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 There, 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 flip. Yes. Photoshop, like what people use for those, for what Instagram, everyone on Instagram uses to make themselves look better. Yeah. That is, I think, nowadays primarily what Photoshop uses. I, I, I don't really condone if if we didn't need Photoshop for the suite for other aspects of like stuff. I would not really condone how much it costs. Uh, there's there's a lot of other services that are cheaper or even free that I think are just as good. Why? Oh, let me hold on. There's a hydrate. Let me do that quick. Thank you. Uh, why does the surface change their volume indicator? Lower volume click on the opposite. What what do you mean? I don't think I'm parsing. Like the volume indicator is like reverse what it should be. Oh, 
it's not in the corner and up and down anymore. Now it's at the bottom in the middle and horizontal. Oh, well, that's the trick. Never update anything. Until they force you. No, you should update your devices periodically. Yeah. Oh, I, I did hydrate. Thank you for that. You, you did it correctly. Dungeon tech tip and a unique and interesting channel. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna quickly. Oh, I'm just gonna clean it out on the edge. And then I'm gonna move over. That, that, uh, yeah. Why would that not be? You live in the gutter. <laughs> the last section of the end. I get it started and then I thought we're fine.
Let's talk Mario movie. The Chris Pratt of the video game adaptation. Yeah, you, I, isn't there? A, there's a teaser coming out today, isn't there? For it, I believe. I believe that's accurate statement. Chris Pratt. Chris Pratt as the Mario. And let me let me just be like upfront. I honestly don't have a lot of personal stake in the. Is it gonna be any good game? I've not. You know, I've played Mario games, but I've never been like super invested in Mario as like a character or franchise personally. I was always more of a PlayStation, Final Fantasy kind of kind of girl, so. Like, I'm not, like, super emotionally invested in if this movie will be any good. I guess my hope is that it'll be, like... Hmm. Yeah, it's alright. Kind of like the, um, Sonic movies. <laughs> You'll enjoy some medicinals while watching it, yeah. Mario is, like, Cloud, and... Princess Peach is like Croc from the PS1. <laughs> See, I thought you were gonna go, well, Mario is like Cloud and Princess Peach is like Cloud when he dresses up as a as a as a woman. That's where I thought you were going with it. As I read it. Not even King K rule. The see. So I think that at best the Mario movie is gonna be like like Sonic. Where it's like that was that wasn't bad. It was solidly pretty pretty good. You know. I enjoyed it. I'm not sure I'm gonna watch it much more than just the one time. You know, that's sort of the... I think that's, like, the goal with it, in my mind. Like, one of those movies where you're, if you were watching broadcast TV for some reason, and it was on, I don't know, one of the higher cable panels, and you didn't really have anything going on, you'd go, oh, yeah, I'll watch that. That was a pretty good movie. But you're not, like, actively seeking it out. Good movie, like the 99 classic Small Soldiers, exactly. <laughs> the thing is, like, don't, like, Donkey Kong, don't hoard bananas. Like, they don't have an infinite shelf life. Like, yes. Bananas do have a very solid health life, but they're not going to last forever. It's not worth it. be brown by the end of the week and then what you're gonna make some bread no one makes bread yeah exactly i don't i don't even like banana bread but i don't really like bananas so i think that's a contributing factor because i do like bread i think it's the bananas that makes it less good for
but I don't, like I said, I don't have like a huge like emotional stake in the Mario movie being any good. Because it's definitely going to be one of those movies that I kind of accidentally watch when I'm like bored and it's on streaming. You know? Rather than like something I actively don't see, so. If, you know, but I definitely enjoy some uh, online drama, especially when it's like low stake online drama. Like, um, like, oh no, the movie trailer wasn't as good as people thought. One of my favorite things back, back in the day was, uh, I, was, I, I enjoyed seeing people freaking out, um, when there was like a big game release and the servers weren't able to handle the amount of people playing got just seeing all the people go online on like forums and stuff yeah exactly exactly like overwatch too so like the best thing is like so like blizzard's a good example like back in the day you know It'd be a World of Warcraft expansion comes out, right? And obviously, like, everyone knew you weren't going to be playing much the first day. Because the servers were going to be a mess. But that didn't stop people from going on the forums and, like, venting their frustrations about it. And it's like, this is the fifth expansion, dude. Like... Why did you think to take off work the day of the expansion release? Because they're on the forums going like, I took off work to enjoy this game. Just like, yeah, cool. Why did you do it the day it came out? Like, there's a long track record of this not working. Um, but like, sometimes the anger, like there's a lot of like, I was inconvenienced for like three hours this morning. I deserve like a year, a free year subscription to the game that happens in that. Like that's a very common, like I'm exaggerating slightly, but there's always the like, if the servers aren't running, we should be compensated for the time. Yeah, the I demand compensation uh, is that's a super common theme. In, in these uh, sort of things. Um, like, I'm not able to play the game I paid for when I want because your servers are down. So I deserve like a bunch of free whatever subscription time, like gold, in-game gold or you know, anything really. Um, but if it goes on, if the if the uh, server issues continue long enough, it gets really out there, and like people start having like meltdowns on the forums about it, and it's very entertaining because it starts to get less and less comprehensible as uh, as the day wears on, and it, it's more fun to see how people react to not being able to play a video game one day than actually playing the video game sometimes. The, uh, the one that always sticks out to me, I think it was, I, I forget, it was one of the World of Warcraft or Diablo. It was a Blizzard game. But the servers weren't working day one. And this person went on like this long unintelligible post about how they were feeling about not being able to play the second and it was like they were trying to do some sort of analogy about like how they have like a mailbox and blizzard right now is a truck that, or a, a van or a bus or something 
careening down the street and like ran over their beautiful mailbox and like it got weird so fast and they're like i feel like blizzard has crushed the mailbox of my soul with their bad driving and i'm just like whoa it's a game yeah You remember when Smash Bros. for the Switch came out at midnight and people below me screamed when the server didn't think? Okay, so like the, yeah, so like you're in like a dorm or uh, an apartment or something and like the people below you literally were like screaming that it wasn't, wasn't playing. You live in a condo complex, calm the mailbox of yourself. <laughs> there you go. That's the new term for today, is mailbox of my soul. And, you know, I don't I don't have no sympathy for these people because like they're <laughs> and some letters and don't see the mailbox of the salt yeah it's like it's scary because you don't know you know if you open yourself up then anyone can reach out to you and deliver something and yeah, most of the time, like, it's good. Some, there's a lot of, you know, people people send a lot of stuff to your, to your soul. It's just like, okay, here's a catalog. Here's a, you know, oh no, here's some, like, someone asking for fundraising money for whatever. You know, there's a lot of stuff to filter in your soul there. Sometimes you get really good things. Like, oh, here's like a something really nice from a friend and then sometimes you get but you but it's you're, you're always scared about the improbable thing of bearing your soul and letting mail come to the mailbox of your soul and like what if someone sends me in and it's like it's not gonna happen but like you're always a little scared about it and you know like, maybe i shouldn't shouldn't put up the little red flaggy thing on the side of my mailbox which I know isn't used for receiving mail, but, you know, it works. Legally, only you and your post office of your soul often are allowed to reach into the mailbox of your soul. Yeah, well, the the mailbox, the, po the post office is like, that's like the person you trust the most with your soul. I, I think this metaphor doesn't actually work, but we're gonna roll with it. And sometimes, like, a video game company is like a out of control snowplow and just crushes the mailbox. That sort of thing, like, I do have sympathy for these people, because, like, if the video game release du jour is, like, the biggest deal in your life, like, you're not, you're sort of, you're, you're projecting some sort of unhappinesses in your life, I think, often is the case. At least if you're at the point where you're having, like, a meltdown on a public forum about it. Like, and, you know, that's an uncomfortable place to be. You don't even steal any of your envelopes. RSVP some weddings, yeah. 
You don't trust any other government official to see. Yeah, like, the post office is the most trustworthy government brand. It's regularly rated, like, the highest, uh, government entity. And every RSVP should post the funeral. Well, yeah, if the IRS actually did their job and took money from the rich for, like, social services, I would really like them. But they don't. Oh, did they? Did they finally get more of a budget to go after them? Because that was the thing they said is, and I believe it, they're like, it is expensive to go after the wealthiest people, because you, like, you have to pay auditors and all that. Um... Yeah, well, if, if Elon buys Twitter, I think a lot of people are just going to jump ship. And Twitter will kind of just devolve and become, like, a thing that people don't really pay as much attention to. Yeah, Honestly, they probably won't go to anything specific. Like, there won't be, like, a replacement. I, I think it'll just... It'll just sit there and people will just... do something else. No. Um, you want the IRS to be run like a for-profit business specifically targeting rich people, and if you lie on taxes and fight us, then you have to pay the bills for the resources we had to waste proving you were wrong. Yeah, I think that's a good way to go. I think we could probably even expand on that. Make it even more stringent. Like, if you, uh, go too far with your company too many times, like, the IRS just seizes the company. Do you think Tesla cars can autopilot directly into the mailbox? Well, I'm sure they could. They're the new, uh, blizzard, I guess. Now, I only tangentially saw the stuff with Overwatch 2, because after all the stuff that has happened with Blizzard, between, like, mistreating its employees and, like, hiding sexual harassment and stuff like that, I have stopped playing Blizzard games and haven't touched them since. So, like, I haven't been particularly closely following, like, new releases or anything like that, but even I saw some of the Overwatch stuff. I think there was, like, 30,000 people in queue for Overwatch 2. There was probably a couple sale full mailboxes that were crushed that day.
Oh, hi. I had a puppy come ask for attention and love. So, I'll be one second. Yep, yep. Well, I have plenty of puppy happening. <laughs> he is looking right here. There you can hear the squeaky toy. So, I am on a minor puppy break because one of them really wanted to sit on my lap. So, so here we are. Okay, are you done? No. Ah, ah. Yeah, we're on a mandatory puppy break. Gonna set you down. Okay, one last. <gasps> oh, I'm sorry. She wasn't particularly pleased that I set her down. But now they're back to wrestling. Alright. So, I'm gonna see how far I can go. Well, they do. Hey, if I finish Owen, you know, I can do some stupid. I don't know if I will or not, but that'd be pretty fun. I could do another Gilboo Ruru. We need some, we need some scenes, like Nines making potatoes at Soria. Some, some badly drawn little scene. Oh, 
which chicken scene are you referring to? Also throwing chickens into the lake. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I don't think that one's aired yet. Where I'm, where you're like, I make chicken. Uh, that was like our most recent episode. You 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 made some chicken for me to make fried chicken, and I was like, no, I need a dead chicken. Also, just curling chickens into a lake for Storm Grammy is good too, though. I feel like that'd probably be more popular of a show rather than drawing character art like this. I mean, just like doodling stupid shit quickly and badly. Well, I think it's time for the puppies to use the restroom. So I'm going to go on a short break here. It won't be very long, uh, hopefully. So I will be right back while I take them out to the bathroom.
All right, we are back. Thanks for waiting. The, uh, you know, taking puppy, two puppies out to use the bathroom is always a little chaotic. And I see while I was gone that you caught a Rhyhorn and you're not sure why your boss isn't pleased. I don't know. I mean, Rhyhorn's a pretty solid Pokemon. Not my favorite. Maybe, maybe... Maybe your boss just doesn't like Rhyhorn. Yeah, I think... I think Rhyhorn doesn't usually make it into my, like, final team, but Rhyhorn's a very good Pokemon. I don't get it. Right on might though, or these days right barrier. Yeah, I think they're a very solid addition. If you're looking for sort of that rock type Pokemon. I, I think right isn't right barrier rock fighting? I am looking forward to the new Pokemon game. I think that's coming out next month. Oh, it's still rock round. It just has like the like protector armor stuff on it, so I thought it might be fighting. But maybe. Maybe. Yeah, I guess sometimes the the look don't always. What, what are you playing, though? Is it Arceus? Is it... Like Sword and Shield? What... What Pokemon? That's your right. Oh, Pokemon Go. Well, see, that's just on your phone. Too early for what? Pokemon talk? <laughs> the switch would be a little too obvious. Yeah, I, that's fair. Too early in life for for any of it. Top guys come in and say, tip this, and I say, give me a few minutes, I'm taking down the steel gym. Yeah. I think that's fair. So I haven't actually ever played Pokemon Go. Can you see, do you see other players in it? Like, if you're playing at work, do you see, like, your co-workers also playing at work? Not really. It's kind of like an asynchronous thing. Oh, it's pretty dead. It has been a while since it came out, I see. Like, Pokemon Go is like quite a while ago that it released.
mostly play it for League matches, and when I get a new Pokemon game, I use it to port new Pokemon in. Oh, I didn't know that. It worked that way, that's for sure. You just finished Shield with the exception of any post game? Yeah. See, I like... I, en I enjoyed Pokemon Shield quite a lot. I... I played Shield as well, I didn't get Sword. Um, but... And Arceus. Arceus was okay, I think. I don't know. It was not being like a core Pokemon game. I played through most of it. I don't think I really finished it, but I, I enjoyed the open world concept in Pokemon. That was nice. Um, but like, yeah, I think I preferred Shield. You can transport your Pokemon to a Pokemon home, and then from there just put them in your box. You can only have one box for the free service, but it's all you really need. That's pretty cool. Sort of continuing the Pokemon tradition of, like, always being able to trade through the different generations in game. Well, I think, isn't Violet and... I haven't seen too much, but isn't Violet and Scarlet supposed to have a bit more of that Arceus-style open-world gameplay? Relatively to the other Pokémon? I, I haven't... I'm, I'm not, like... I don't follow a lot of video game news super intently but you know that like sword and shield had that but except for you couldn't catch pokemon in the overworld and stuff like that but um i feel like they've been moving in that direction Yeah, that's the thing is, I I don't... Lexi hasn't really played any of the Pokemon games in some time. Because she has trouble, like, focusing on them. Uh, although she might play the new ones, maybe. We'll see. Um, so, my, like, normal built-in trading for the stuff in the other edition person is uh, not very reliable on that front to fill to max the Pokedex. Probably, uh, you know, I always choose my Pokemon edition just based on the title, pretty much. So, like, I went with Shield because I like Shield more than Sword. And, um, I'm probably gonna get Violet because I like Violet as a color more than Scarlet. So. I've always chosen my uh, Pokemon edition. Pretty much since the beginning. I just like, which title do I like more?
Oh, it is exciting that Pokemon next Pokemon's coming out in like a month, I think. Like mid uh, mid November. Sort of crept up on me. So I'm looking for an old Bob. I imagine that was Bob. That may, based on the context, but you know, the shy guy, you know. Never know. Yeah, we need a mystery. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, that's always like that's always what ruins a good scary like story is when they explain. Or have like a reason behind it. Like sometimes things are just unknown, you know. Sometimes it's just a it's just a mystery. But that. Like, I feel like that's always the thing in scary stuff, is that if it's supernatural, like, you know, whatever, like a ghost or a demon, whatever, if the, if the, the monster in your scary stuff is supernatural, then I think knowing why or no understanding the nature of it makes it less scary you know but on the flip side if your your bad guy is like a serial killer or whatever you know some sort of human i think 
understanding the intent can actually be scarier in some cases, I think. So, even if the intent doesn't make logical sense or anything like that, like, I think understanding the reasoning behind why are they doing that can actually be kind of terrifying as well. So, you know, I'm not a huge fan of the series of movies, but the Dark Knight series, I think Heath Ledger Joker struck such a chord, for example, with people because you learn why he's doing it. And the reason is because, like, you know, because he can and he wants to cause chaos and there's not a good reason. It's just like a reason, but you understand, you learn the reason and the reason is just like because. And I think that's unnerving for a lot of people that someone could cause that much like pain and death just because. And that's sort of what what really raised him up as a as a villain character in those in that movie. Is that you do get told why he's doing it. Yeah. And that is part of what makes him scary. Also, yeah, he did it because he's a nerd. <laughs> Real dork patrol. They're lying on their backs next to each other, just sort of like e making weird noises at each other right now. It's very distracting. One is grunting like a pig, all super low. I think they are trying to get belly rubs. Maybe I should turn around and give them belly rubs. That was very funny. One was high pitched and one was very low pitched. <laughs> They're just like laying on their backs, staring at each other, grunting and making weird noises. They seem to appreciate the belly rubs though. A mega transport ship used less fuel by having... So they took, like, one of those giant cargo ships and stuck sails on it. Huh. So the wind-powered propulsion system used less fuel than the fuel-powered propulsion system. 
was on the bike. Okay. I'm guessing, I'm guessing based on the size of the ship and everything, basically it was sails plus engine. Like they didn't do sail only. But like they, they took an engine system and just like added sails to help add extra propulsion. Some sort of weird vertical sail system? Interesting. Is it sort of like the vertical sails on, like, those, uh, super fast sailboats that they use for, like, races? Because I could see a shipping company moving over to sales because, you know, not for environmental reasons, of course, but because, you know, fuel is expensive. Ocean wind farm would be good. I think that's one thing that I Two million gallons of crude oil, but hey, at least we used less once we get there. Oh, as a as an oil tanker. And funny if that what if that's the case. I think that's a thing we're gonna see increasingly as just like as thing as green technologies get more affordable and continue to do so it's it's less about like our 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 hope for salvation here is isn't the goodwill of these large corporations it's just that it'll become cheaper to use the green energy than it will to use traditional fossil fuels. I think that's the only way in a capitalist hellscape that you can realistically switch over to green energy. You just have to make it more affordable. Do I wish we were in a world where people would, uh, you know, do the right thing for, because it's the right thing? For sure. But I think realistically, you just have to show that it's cheaper to do it the better way. Get the electric prices, car prices down, gas went up to 449 
for what I have analyzed as no good reason. Yeah, typically gas prices are just sort of the like OPEC going like, we want more money now, please. Of course, in America, our tax prices are extremely, our, our tax, no, our, not our tax, our gas prices are extremely subsidized by taxpayers. So, our pay at the pump is a lot less than a lot of other countries because they use, uh, government uses tax paying, taxpayers' money to artificially decrease the price. But there's a lot of places where, uh, you know, 449 is, would be unthinkably cheap. I think in parts of Europe, it's like $8 basically for a liter, which is less than a gallon. It's weird seeing people talking about buying skins in video games for the full price of the full video games. Who's doing that? So you're saying like, I'm buying a character skin for like 60 bucks. Is that in a specific game? Oh, is this like in an Overwatch thing? Like skins in Overwatch are like 60 bucks? someone complain about paying $20 for a helmet in Halo only to get a very slightly different color shade of it in a random drop. Oh yeah, I know. I, I really enjoy Diablo. Or enjoyed Diablo, I should say, in general. And I do sometimes go like, oh man, that would be nice to play. Uh, yeah. I, like, the call has never been big enough for me personally to go overlook. I know, I know certain aspects of Blizzard have gotten better, but not every aspect of Blizzard has gotten better, and like, None of none of the games that they've put out have been enough for me to go, yeah, I'm willing to like overlook whatever X, Y, or Z thing. I haven't really played it, but there are Diablo like games. I think Path of Exile is supposed to be. Diablo, eh? And they're, they're pretty, I, from what I hear, they're all right. That company, like I haven't really read into it, but I haven't heard anything particularly bad. Ubisoft is frustrating because the leadership is awful too, but it seems like they let more passion products through. Yeah. I mean, realistically, 
there's like for me I barely play any AAA games like I play Final Fantasy 14 which is you know it's one of the larger company games I play weirdly I don't have much of a problem with EA yeah but EA doesn't really put out any like games I'm particularly interested in either like I play Final Fantasy 14 I'll play a couple like grand strategy style games and then other than that I pretty much only play like indie games like small mid to small development size games can't think of an EA game you're interested in that they killed yeah they killed battlefield i guess i'll play destiny too and that's more of a triple a game i'll play that sometime but like i'd say a lot of my time is spent just playing indie games it's just like i don't know Sometimes the AAA game just feels so watered down nowadays, in general. Like, the generic AAA feels super watered down and formulaic. Because I think... You see this in movies, too. Um, they're used like when you only put out so many things you can't really be experimental anymore so when you have when you're going for games that have like huge budgets you're not paying for smaller games that are maybe a little more experimental um, and, and, you know, you get a lot of crap if you go experimental, like, don't get me wrong. So, people will bemoan, like, okay, the only movies that come out now are a couple of rom-coms and, like, superhero movies. And, yeah, I get that, but they're also, like, what's shown to make the most money, right? And what it is, is... They're just not making as many movies nowadays as they used to. Um, it's just the reality. Like, back in, like, the 30s, 40s, 50s, they were just pumping out movies all the time. So many movies. And the thing is, a ton of them are just crap, and you never hear about them. But... All, and, and all we would talk about ever from those periods are the really good ones. But for every, like, Maltese Falcon or Citizen Kane or whatever, there's, like, a bunch of truly not very good movies that had, like, stupid plots and they were just sort of, you know, maybe well-written or well-performed, if you're lucky, but, like, they just were making movies for the sake of making movies at a certain point. So, you do get some fantastic movies when you have a larger quantity of movies being made. But, as time has gone on, the studios have just started making less and less movies overall the number of movies, and when you're making less movies, you need to... you need to make sure those movies are turning a profit. Because... if you are making, let's say, 50 movies a year as a studio, and you're spreading your... let's say you have a studio budget of a hundred million dollars, and you're making a hundred movies a year. I'm just doing simple math there because I can't do more complex math. 
So each movie gets on average a million dollars in budget. And then each, so each movie only has to make back like 1.5 million or 2 million or something like that to be technically sort of turning a profit here, right? So the performance on these movies doesn't actually have to be that intense, but you're putting out quantity. And maybe one of these movies only comes back with $800,000 instead of a million and it's a loss. But one of the movies comes back with $3 million because it was a better made movie and it's sort of averaging out. So you can, and when you're putting out a hundred movies a year, there's a lot more room for like experimentation. Hey, maybe this will work because the more successful movies will help cover the failures. Um, but then if you start shifting your movie production thing, so now you still have a budget of a hundred million dollars for your studio this year, but you're only making 10 movies instead of a hundred movies. Now you have to, each of those movies is getting a budget of $10 million. But that means it also has to profit $10 million. And there's less room for error because you only have 10 movies that have to make over $10 million. Um, so when someone's like, I want to make a movie about a talking toilet, who, you know, I don't know, I'm just like, you know, some, like, off-the-wall idea. And then you have someone going, I want to make a sequel to this movie that made $100 million. You're gonna just go with the $100 million one. Because you're only making 10 movies, and they have to clear those uh, profits. So you have a lot less wiggle room, which uh, sort of demands if you want to be making money as a studio, it demands that you make safe movies rather than um, trying new things, trying new IPs, trying new like concepts. Profit kills games. I mean, so, I mean, sort of. I mean, there's the, there's just the hard realization of, you know, in our current capitalist society, art needs to be funded by profit. Like, that's just the reality of the society we live in. There's not like, there isn't really a situation where you can say something is art for art's sake. Um, whether it's a game, a movie, a painting, anything like that. Like, we live in a capitalist society, so we have to... And you have to, like, deal with, you know, food and shelter and stuff like that. So, if you're a video game studio, that only puts out one game every year or two. That one game really has to perform well to keep your game studio afloat. But if you're a game studio, like, like think about how many games came out from larger companies back when you had like the Thank you for the squeaky toy. That's helping my commentary. So, like, let's say... I mean... Let's say you are a game company developing games for the SNES. And it's relatively easy to program 
and design games for the SNES relative to like the AAA titles nowadays, which are very complex. Yeah, I know. I know the squeaking is under underscoring my point here. Um, <laughs> but like, you know, it costs money to make these things. And it's, I think what, what it is, is to a certain degree, it's capitalism is blandifying things because if you're only making 10 movies a year, as opposed to a hundred movies a year, your overhead goes down. You don't need a bunch of, you don't need as many studios, even if you're spending a hundred million a year on 10 movies as opposed to a hundred million a year on a hundred movies. Your overall overhead goes down because you're not paying for, you know, as many studio spaces to do simultaneous filming, things like that. Um, so you can devote more of your budget to the film itself or to a hiring a big name actor you know whatever you want to put your money toward um which should in theory make a better product you can have more intent on a video game you can have more like high fidelities uh you know uh textures for your for everything because you can spend more on this thing but I think part of what doesn't translate is that your character's pants can look really, really good, but if the game is really bland, it's just a bland game, you know, with good pants. So, but what it what it really is is it's coming down to I think my my general thought process here is that it comes down to it's cheaper to run only produce 10 movies a year i'm just using the movie industry because it's easier but it's the true true in any entertainment industry really um it's cheaper there's less overhead and you have to hire less staff to um, make 10 movies a year than 100 movies a year. So a lot more of what gets earned. So let's say you have 10 movies that earn 200 million or 100 movies that earn 200 million overall between all of them. And you've invested 100 million in them. Well, because you're not maintaining a larger workforce, a larger um, studio area, like you don't need as many buildings, physical real estate to run 10 movies than you do 100 movies. That reduces your annual overhead. So in the long term, you're gonna be making more in profit. And that's where you start to see like each individual movie doesn't necessarily cost more. Your budget doesn't necessarily go up, but your annual year over year profits will start to see better returns if you're looking at a purely financial standpoint, if you reduce overhead. And I think that is sort of the root pause between this sort of consolidation. So you'll see this with company mergers as well. Like, um, I mean, this H HBO Discovery merger, right? You saw a ton of jobs laid off when that happened. Because what it is, is like, hey, HBO Discovery each had a marketing team. Well, now it's one company and we don't need two marketing teams. 
So there goes half the people's jobs. Because consolidation is cheaper because now you're not paying for... Now the United company isn't paying for two, uh, two marketing teams between each other. You're just paying for the one. Hey, hey girls. Let's not bark right now. Um... So, I think, and, and that's sort of what happens. That's an example in company mergers, but you see that internally happen as well, where it's like, well, we don't need three studio spaces if we can spread them out over th 10 films in a year, as opposed to 30 studio spaces spread out over 100 films in a year. So you're consolidating your uh, your crew, your employee workforce. You're consolidating your physical space overhead. You're consolidating your resources, like the number of cameras you have to own and maintain. Um, things like that, which which is great for your bottom line in a general sense because now you're now it's cheaper but what it leads to long term is that when you only have 10 movies instead of 100 you can't try new things you have to go with the safe option whether that be whatever superhero movie or whatever you know so basically what it is is the pursuit of profit over anything else slowly creeps and demands this consolidation into you know if you if you took it to its absurd conclusion you know eventually it'd be sort of the cyberpunk Here's the one corporation that does everything, you know, it's like the <laughs> girls, girls. It's like in Wally. Yes, thank you. It's like in Wally, where there's like, by and large, the one company that like pretty much did everything on Earth. Um, you know, and that's sort of the absurd conclusion, but, you know, if there's one company that provides everything, like, you don't need redundancies. Like, if you have a supermarket that does every, that, that's like the only supermarket, you don't need to hire staff for the three or four supermarkets in the area, which means there's less jobs for people. Um, less job security as a result of being less jobs overall and all this sort of stuff and the idea of a like free mar thank you the idea of like a free marketplace falls apart when you allow for monopolies and large consolidations of things because it, 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 the individual company, its goal is to destroy the free market because if you have no competitors, then people have to buy what you're selling. And since the girls are just sitting here barking at me, I'm going to take them out one more time. We're going to do another short break here. I'll be right back.
right, we're back. <laughs> Sorry for that. The puppies just, you know, they're little babies. They need to use the bathroom. Fairly free. Let's see how we're looking here. I think, I think that's all of the gray and belt work. Other than on the boot, obviously. But yeah. So, basically what I was saying is just that the movies, video games, any industry like this, um, that consolidation, it's sort of like, to put this in terms Americans really understand well, because we spend 90% of our time thinking about it, if you think about health insurance, um, <laughs> we spend... If you have a pool of a hundred people versus a pool of 10 people, it's way more contingent on those 10 people to not get sick if there's going to be a secure amount of money coming in. Um, as opposed to a hundred people where you can absorb the cost a little more if there's, if one or two people get sick. It's sort of a similar, a similar concept, but it's that redundancy thing, like, that makes company mergers so shitty. Because, like I said, you know, you don't need two marketing departments as one company. So you might bring a couple people from the old, the other company that you merged with over, but, like... And just make it slightly larger, but you're not you're not gonna keep paying two full teams to do it because that just doesn't make sense. But what that means in real world terms is that now you have a whole department of people no longer getting who just get summarily fired basically for nothing they did. They didn't do anything wrong. Their company just got sold and they happen to be the ones that got cut. That's why there's one of the most uh, like if you if you believe in like the free market and stuff breaking up monopolies is one of like the biggest things you can do to support the free market because a monopoly is inherently anti-free market and don't get me wrong i don't really believe in free market as a concept personally but if you're gonna argue that the free market is a good thing and we should we should definitely aspire towards that then it's sort of your duty to advocate for breaking up of monopolies because it's not because I think people think of companies as like passive entities sometimes where um, it's like, well, they became the monopoly because they were just the best at it and they provided the thing the best. They just won, won the free market, but it's, it's not done passively like that. There are companies are actively trying to undermine and take out competition. I mean, you, you can just look at Amazon for that. And I know I'm on Twitch, but I shouldn't speak, speak ill of Amazon. No, but that's where you really get like, um, like Amazon would intentionally lose money to undercut other competitors until the other competitors went under and then they jacked up their prices. Until like they were the only ones. Yeah, exactly. They're not trying to beat the competition by doing better than them, they're just looking to cut the competition out completely. You're completely right. And that... That's why... a monopoly is, like, the antithesis of a free market. As a concept. 
Because I think a lot of people who believe in the free market sort of have this fairy tale image of it where it's like, well, if someone wants to beat Amazon, they just have to do it, but do it better. And it'll be better for the consumer. But the reality is, is if anyone eh, cut, but I think they ignore the fact that Amazon actively looks for competitors and destroys them and like tries to like kill them before they even have a chance to start. Like there's an active predatory style like hunting that occurs in these sort of monopoly systems. Yes. So Lexi was Lexi is adding in in the Amazon specifically here commentary that Amazon looks at people selling in their marketplace actively analyzes the data of what's selling well and then makes their own versions and undercuts their own the people selling on their own platform and that's what Amazon basics is is they go oh well this TV stand or you know whatever this design of TV stand is selling really well we're gonna make a knockoff version of it for cheap and like basically steal the intellectual property of people using our site who sell things and undercut them and outsell them and drive them off the platform because they've identified something that the consumer wants and and we would like to have that instead. So that like <laughs> and the reason they can get away with that is because the market share of people buying stuff on Amazon compared to any other online marketplace is so wildly out of proportion that even if you if you're selling a TV stand online and you know Amazon is going to steal it from you you still have to go with them because you're going to you're not going to make any sales compared to like they control so much of the online shopping marketplace which is what they really have a monopoly on that if they if you try to sell through like eBay or your own website or anything like that like no one relatively sees it so Amazon so you have to sell on Amazon in order to have a solvent company and then you can do exactly what shy guy says that Amazon not doesn't even have to like search for the competition because the competition has to go on their site and they have all the data right there and they can just remove them once they identify what they want to sell in, in place of you as a tv stand company in my random example <clears throat> And that is why it is important to break up monopolies rather than let companies merge and form larger and larger monopolies. Like, you know, I enjoy Disney. I really like Disney, but they probably shouldn't own 80% of all of American entertainment. <laughs> I don't know if that's exactly how much they own, but they should own quite as large of a chunk of American entertainment as they do. Because it, it is a ridiculously large amount. Because what that means now is, yeah, you get a bunch of cool, like, I love Star Wars. I love Marvel. I, you know, I, I, I guess I wouldn't say I love Marvel. I enjoy Marvel stuff. And I like Star Wars a lot. Um, and I want to see all these Star Wars things that they're producing. But I'd also like to see, you know, other sci-fi stories being told by, you know, maybe a more diverse group of people. 
as well. I want to have Star Wars babies. Yeah. I can't. Love. Grub ditto. <laughs> like. Disney shouldn't own as much of the market share in entertainment as it does. Because what it means is, yeah, we get great Star Wars shows, but we would get great Star Wars shows if there were other companies making great sci-fi stories other than Star Wars or fantasy stories other than Star Wars. <laughs> Thank yeah, yeah, shy guy, that's correct. All of that is definitely true. I think we would, yes. It, if it wasn't such a dominating force in the market, you would get good sci-fi stories. Because the thing is, you're going to get more... So if you have a wider array of producers, if you have more TV channels, more game companies, more any whatever movie studios, you're going to have more crap. That's 100% true. Because there's like uh, there's more things and they're not all going to be winners. On <laughs> Star Wars is like Gaston. Yeah, exactly. Um but you're also going to have more gems out there. So, like, if you look at video games, I'm trying to think, like, if you try and think, like, what's some really innovative take the world by storm video games that you've seen out there, a lot of them are going to be indie developers. No, it's not saying every indie game out there is going to be a winner because they're definitely, you know, a lot of indie games are just like people learning how to make games or things like that. But. Like. A channel dedicated entirely to crap. Yeah. Well, think of it this way, since who is here? Would you see a game like Rhapsody be made in the current environment? A game, a, a JRPG based around tactical combat with puppets, musical scenes, full on musical singing scenes and things like that. Yeah, exactly. A random indie dev would be the one to do it. Not, but it, in a big, would, would you see a large company make it? Definitely not, because... <laughs> I don't, see, I don't think Nintendo would do it. Because what, you know, it's a JRPG, ultimately, is what Rhapsody is. But... It was being made at a time when there was a lot of JRPGs being made. And... Yeah. But it, it's not safe for a J... So if you think of JRPG as a genre... What, and as my, and I, I'm a huge Final Fantasy fan. But Final Fantasy dominated the market. And then suddenly the style of gameplay that became the standard for Final Fantasy is Final Fantasy style RPGs. And they're probably not even the first ones to do it, but they're the first successful ones, like really large successful ones. And they kept making that formula and that became the safe way to make a JRPG. Um, and yeah, you get variations on it. But you don't get, like, wildly new, different, fun ideas. 
you know, you don't get you don't get like earth, earthbound where unless you go to an indie thing like and you get like Undertale, you know. But that's because that's a sing like a small developer just making a game out of passion rather than a large company that is required to turn a profit with everything they make. Um, because, yeah, a game like Undertale is fantastic, but it's not safe. Oh, yeah, I'm... Well, Square. Yeah, Square Soft, Square Enix. In the JRPG space, for sure. Is dominated by Square Enix. <coughs> uh, ownership of Dragon Quest and Secret of Mana. Yeah. And so, so yeah, your your Dragon Quest games, for example, here are one of the most successful sort of JRPGs out there. And we're on Dragon Quest like fifty thousand now, because it's safer to make another Dragon Quest sequel that is similar, but not, you know, has slight variations, but it's largely similar. They want to buy more NFTs, yeah. Just to sell the franchises so they can get more NFTs, I know. But it's like Marvel, and so Dragon Quest is like the video game, like, equivalent of Marvel. The Marvel movies aren't bad. They're fun. They're entertaining. They're somewhat formulaic. And... It's all within one IP, and I might have lost connection here. Maybe, maybe not. I think that's my... <clears throat> and I'm realizing my throat's getting a little scratchy, so let me take a drink. <clears throat> yes, thank you for the hydrate. Oh, I'll take two drinks then. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Please stop. <laughs> You're wasting your ninth coin. <clears throat> I think the hydrate comes up in chat. Like the actual chat, but it doesn't come up on screen in our little uh, broadcast window. But I'm seeing it. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm going to run out of drink soon. It might be. I, you know... But I'm seeing them, so I, I've been okay. That's all I that's all I can drink right now. Um But yeah, Dragon Quest I think is a great example. So we're on Dragon Quest like ten or eleven or fifteen, you know, whatever Dragon Quest we're on now. Because Dragon Quest is a very successful franchise, so it's safer to make more of them rather than try a new out there RPG like like Undertale or, um, you know, I mean, I'd say like back in the day, like um, they should make another Babylon Small. Yeah. And that's a case of like, 
trying to make a new IP using like more problematic RP like business practices and having it fall apart. The, the Morbius of action RPGs. And I bet you if Babylon's fall, that's the thing is like they were trying something new and they got burned by it. And I know it wasn't like new new because they were using pretty tried and true like game as a service kind of concepts. But like they tried to do something, a, do, a different IP basically, create a new IP and got burned for it. So they don't, why would you want to take that risk when you could just make another Diablo or another Dragon's Quest? Um, I mean, but the, the realistically, the ideal situation is that you have large companies, you have small companies, and if you want to see more variation and artistic stuff in games these companies should be spending less per game and making more um more games overall because you're gonna get crap games but you're also going to get amazing fantastic new games that like hit the cultural consciousness in ways that you know, yet another Dragon Quest game. About time for a Legend of Dragoon remake. See, but even that remakes are like pretty safe. Cause you're like, I'm gonna take something that has nostalgia value and try and cash in on nostalgic value. And I'm not against remake, you know, or anything like that, but if the goal, uh, if you, if like what you want to see as a consumer is more IPs, more innovative gameplay, things like that, it demands that a lot of crap gets made. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so if you, let's say you make a Legend of Dragoon remake and it's not just an up of graphics in the same exact game. Because that's going to cash in on... Generally speaking, things like that are going to cash in on people who have nostalgia. You know, you don't have to play with an emulator and the textures are a little nicer. Like, that that's one thing. But a remake, which I think is what you're sort of, sort of like the Final Fantasy VII remake, where it's Final Fantasy VII, but it is like a new game. Yeah, you know, it's not it's not the same system as the original Final Fantasy 7. And it has like a different different story elements and stuff. Um uh, the Final Fantasy 7 remake style would be great for Legend of Dragon. Well, and that's the thing is like so they're using a safe option of playing on the nostalgia of people who love Final Fantasy 7 to use some new gameplay techniques. Although I think, you know, it's it's borrowing a lot from like Final Fantasy 15 and th things like more modern Final Fantasy games. And that could theoretically open you up to making other things like a Dread Legend of Dragoon remake in the style of Final Fantasy VII. What's more likely to happen is that you're going to get Final Fantasy VII Remake 2 or, you know, Final Fantasy, um, you know, Final Fantasy XIII Remake, you know rather than a less well-known IP, because it would be less safe. 
to do so. Sony made remaking Last of Us and Horizon Zero Dawn again, even though we got them last gen and they look just fine. Yeah, exactly. Well, and if you do a remake like those, like you don't have to hire new writing staff and stuff. You just need to have some um, of your art and coding team just spruce up the game. Hi, Cooper. There you go. How about an Echo the Dolphin remake? Like, okay, Echo the Dolphin, you know, there was, there's tons of games being produced by a ton of game companies when on the Sega Genesis and SNES years. Like, there was, there was little companies everywhere making all sorts of weird games about, like, dolphins collecting crystals. I think they were alien crystals. I forget. It's been obviously it's been a while since I played Echo the Dolphin, but um, like that that's a weird concept, and it was like you know, but there was so many games being made that you could afford to try and do that, and yeah, your graphics quality isn't gonna be as good. That's why, but there are beloved indie games like Stardew Valley doesn't have like AAA graphics but people adore it because it took the farming sim concept and like built on it in a in new and in innovative ways and just did it really well um and it doesn't need triple a graphics to be successful and be fun to play and I think, I don't know, I think, like, so yeah, talking about, like, The Last of Us and Horizon Zero Dawn remake, like, how much, or, yeah, how much of those did, how much did the graphic updates really help those games, if we're honest? Probably not a lot. It was more like back in the days with Star Wars when... <laughs> George Lucas would be like, I digitally added a guy with a helmet in the background of one scene, and I'm re-releasing the films now in a new edition. We finally have the technology to add that guy with a helmet. Which is what I originally wanted, but didn't have the technology for at the time. So this is the new definitive edition of the Star Wars trilogy. And that man in the helmet, that's Lup Shido. So what I'm saying is, ultimately, if you want better games, we need more shitty games too. We just need more, more games overall. New games, new IPs, 
everything like that. Because I can bet you, like, for every big hit indie game out there, your your Stardew Valley, your your Undertale, you know, there's a lot of indie games that never really get much traction. You know, they might get some moderate success. They might get, you know. Or they just don't really get any. And the people who create them have to just either keep making new stuff or, you know, move on. But. For every, but for everyone that gets made, you have a much higher chance of getting new, innovative, exciting gameplay and great new ideas whereas if you're looking at your you know 18th battlefield game you're not really going to get much innovation there so and there's this the real world added advantage of if there's more people working on video games that means there's more people making money and having a you know getting a living out of it but you know companies don't particularly care let's we'll ignore that right so that's been my my little economic tirade how about that new mario movie huh That's exciting, nostalgia, fun, Mario. That's also the sort of reasoning why you're getting Chris Pratt instead of the original Mario voice actor, because Chris Pratt will bring more attention the movie and drive up sales and they need to make sure it performs well to validate the cost. giving my, my throat a break. I just spent a lot of time Oh, okay. I will stretch. Thank you for the stretch, too. Holland's coming along okay, I think. I have the boots. I have one one more boot to do. Then the hands and the bow and the dagger 
And then I can do some detail work on the bow. And then I'll probably be pretty much done with hole in here. I need a bumper sticker on there. So it's breaking easy. Yeah. Uh, they probably, they probably do have that. We don't know. I drew them facing forward. Breaking in is easy. Breaking out is hard. Now that's a that's a merchandise product. Get like some booty shorts that say that. Some Holland themed booty shorts. We've actually made some pretty good progress while, while we've been ranting about the problem of our non-free market free market and how they affect the entertainment
Eh? Well. I think what I was originally talking about before I appeared sidetracked was the Marco movie. I'm wondering how, uh, my, my, like I was saying at the beginning, I don't have a lot of personal stake in the movie being good or bad. I don't honestly care all that much, but, you know, my hope, I guess, is that it's like, like, my expectation is that it's the sun. Oh, I do care? I don't know. I, you know, I, I feel like I'd care more if you gifted some subs to the channel. <laughs> okay, I will hydrate. Okay. I'm just gonna take one super long drink because you're going a bit heavy on the hydrate here. Yeah. There. I'm gonna disable that button. Um... I think the Mario movie will be either a train wreck or fine. Okay. I'm gonna need to get some more water at this rate. If I'm reviewing a movie I haven't seen, that's pretty much all I can say. There's a lot of movies. Some of them are good. Maybe this one. I don't know. Do you want, do you want to know about a movie I have seen that was good? <laughs> Agnostic movie reviews. Some people might enjoy this movie. Some people might not. Just a, just a little bit. Yeah, Christopher Columbus was a pretty horrible. I think. I think we can agree to that. I think, if I remember correctly, so don't quote me on this, the reason Christopher Columbus got so uh, puffed up in American culture is that Italian Americans, back in the day when they were being, you know, when they, they were being, like, treated as a minority in America, Propped up Christopher Columbus as like, no, no, we're legitimate white people too. Don't, don't, don't hate on us. We're, we're with you. It, 
is sort of like the super simplistic uh, sort of thing that happened. Basically, trying to legitimize Italian Americans for as white people, so people would stop being quite so racist against them. Because America does love being racist. But then it's like, you have to deal with the actual history of Christopher Columbus and how he was absolutely horrible. Yeah, our D&D campaign, we did do a light terrorism, accidentally. To be fair, to us, Soria and Nines weren't actually part of that part of the plan. That was spearheaded by Ulseth and Coromon. So I like to think of it more as Ulseth did a light terrorism. You would think Nines would be the one that would inadvertently blow up a city, but... It was, uh, shockingly Ulsa. If there's anyone in the group you wouldn't expect that from. The... The intent was to just cut power to the town. That was, as far as the plan goes, the idea was shut down the city's power temporarily while we made our escape. That was the intent of the plan, the spirit of the plan. Cause a little chaos, you know, Turn the light, the street lights off, and the lights in the mansion off, in order to make our escape. You know, create a little momentary distraction. Soria, having, and I assume Nines here, having no understanding of the amount of energy and everything in Urban Tech and what it was and, and its power and everything and how it operates. Like, we went, hey, that's on you two. You, you two are the ones who know this stuff. You say that we can turn the power off on command. Great, let's do that. No. And and they went, okay, well, we can destroy this part of, like, the city's conduit, and that will, that should have the desired effect. Not really thinking through how much energy would be released, but, you know, we as the... We did... The, what we did was a prison break, basically, a, a refugee thing. Getting, getting my clan to freedom. I don't think shuttling refugees from imprisonment to freedom is in the human traffic situation. I think that's pretty clearly in the, like, liberation. Kind of, uh, thing. Um, but yeah, we were like, hey, you two are the experts. We are reload, we are freeing prisoners. 
Because we're not, like, relocating them, because they're not going to stay prisoners. They're not prisoners anymore. They're just being assisted by us in being rescued. They already have their freedom, but... And once we get them to a safe area, they're going to be al allowed to, you know, do what they choose to do. So it's not really a relocation of prisoners so much as it is a liberation of unjustly held, kidnapped people. But as far as the town Iron Veil is concerned, like, yeah, that was, that's all on Ulsteth and, uh, Boromon. They don't... I mean, yes. In a sense, like, they need to stick with us because, like, we have the source of food and like the the people who know how to get through this dark cave but it's better than being in prison for the rest of your life and like they already have a decision about what they want to do as a group when they get free finally when we finally arrive so and and we're all on board with that so I mean, no, it was, it was definitely an ad hoc plan. We had like the basic concept that there is this cave that we could escape through. But we, until we actually like got to the keep and freed the prisoners and stuff, there wasn't really a way to make a plan for it. I mean, we did go to the keep with the intent of freeing them. But we didn't know the circumstances in which we would be freeing them until we were doing it, pretty much. Because <laughs> we knew they were being held there, that's the reason we went. But, yeah, there wasn't, there wasn't too much we could do planning, because we didn't know exactly how many. We didn't know if we were going to be able to get in and out without being noticed or, you know, anything like that. Oh, yes, that that was great. Very serendipitous, like, then basically causing, like, a, a skirmish between two members of the same household in order to create a diversion to escape from. I felt like that went quite well. I was very pleased with that. I don't think we were necessarily prepared for the number of uh, Ristati prisoners that we were going to be ferrying out. But, you know, we can make do. Luckily, druids can create magic water with the create food and water spell. Or create water spell. Um, and we have a magic knight. Otherwise, we'd probably be pretty screwed. Um, 
I was saying we really, really should have killed that, like, evil doctor scientist guy who is working with Brukelion and gotten rid of his, like, weird armature apparatus thing. Because we're definitely going to run into, like, Glenvy or some other person from from that keep like as like a horrible enhanced enemy down the line the under bean railroad because there's railroad tracks and we underground and we ate a lot of beans down there Well, minecart track. Thanks for the subscription. Who? Yeah. Like we really screwed. I did not. I w I was so taken aback by his like creepy creepy demeanor. Like we really should have just taken that guy out. Like right off the bat. It's gonna, he's gonna be a problem later. For sure. Like, there's a zero chance that he won't be a problem. I don't think we even learned his name because Soria isn't about murder. She she will she's the only times she has ever killed anyone in this whole campaign has been to protect her clan. The only people she's ever killed have been people working for Brucellian. Flash Glenvy. People who have actively tried to capture, imprison, and use her family. And that's it. Never sent. It's not even about, like, do they deserve it? It's just about, like, protecting, protecting her own. She knows that, like, Olseth and Nines can handle themselves. Like, even if she thinks of them as part of, like, her family, she knows they have, like, the ability to protect themselves. But, uh, most of her clan and not. So, she needs to do what she can to protect them. When has Nines ever demonstrated that he can handle himself? You, you've stabbed a couple people to death. Here and there. With your rapier. You're really good at running away. Jumping out of windows. You know. Running off and starting fires, all that sort of stuff. So like, you have a you have a track record of having transported, teleporting yourself into a bay. Like, you have a proven track record of being able to escape from bad situations. The only people that story has ever actively killed intentionally have been people who are holding, capturing, or otherwise attacking her people. 
Otherwise, she's been very consistent about trying to spare lives whenever possible. But I think that is fairly reasonable. Unlike Olseth, who's just like, I'm gonna cut people's heads off and sl slash them up. You know, he loves to do that. I think Olseth's actually the, like, secret, like, murder hobo of the group. It's like, he's like, I'm gonna cut people you are who are about to be decapitated. You, city, which is about to be exploded by my hand. I have masterminded this terrorist action for you, city. Like, I think Ulsa's gone after the Tashira noon, but he's, like, gonna become the monster. That he's trying to stop. Yeah, it was technically it was Thamus that blew up the city. But like, Ulseth hired Thamus. Ulseth understood the level of explosive power within the uh, the Fervent Tech. Something that I can easily say Nines and Soria did do not. To be fair. <laughs> I think all Seth is secretly the baddie. He will absolutely help anyone who asks him to identify the criminal. I think by the end of the campaign, we're gonna see Olseth as the new head of the Tashira Noon. That, that's my, that's my conspiracy theory. Famous is gonna be the mayor or hard dick. Is the flame sword hot enough to cauterize wounds that it, as it decapitates? I think it actually is, yes. Um it does 2d6 fire damage. That's that's a lot of fire damage. All stuff confirmed Jedi, yeah. Exactly. No, I, I'm I'm pretty sure that the uh, the flamey sword cauterizes mo most wounds that it causes if the sword if the flame is on. Is like the does also has flamey sword cauterize him when he cuts with it. So if he cuts someone's head off or arm off, it it cauterizes the. Partially, we have a answer. Partially. Probably depends on the amount of fire damage done. 
they're just talking about how Olseth is secretly the actual villain of the campaign. Because he likes to, he just like willy nilly cuts people's heads off and stuff, and he's the one that masterminded the Iron Veil explosion. Yeah. Uh. Does suggestion work with speak with dead? Suggestion, I don't, is not a concentration spell. I know that much. Speak with dead, it probably is during the effect of the spell. I don't know. Oh, man. Let, let's see. Speak with dead. It lasts 10 minutes. Um. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think either are concentration. Okay, so suggestion is concentration. Speak with dead isn't, though. Yeah, speak with animals, speak with dead, and speak with plants are not concentration. So. Oh man. I've never noticed this. Usually concentration doesn't come up for suggestion because we either see the results immediately or we're doing more RP related stuff at the time. Yeah, that's true. So it doesn't really matter. And nines isn't regularly keeping up concentration spells on things, so. It, it hasn't really come into, into play particularly. Did you know that speak with animals can be cast ritually and not use a spell slot? <laughs> you just have to take 10 minutes to cast it. Usually concentration. Yeah, yeah. I add some creepy necromancy stuff to the suggestion spell in the components and you'll let it. For, like, for working with Speak With Dead. Yeah. I think that's fair. Yeah, get speak with plant to really round out your abilities. 
I just like that Soria, the druid, has never once shown interest in talking to an animal. And is the only one in the party that cannot do so. You would say you could talk to yourself about problems, but you're not sure how that's true. Yeah. Yeah, you use Skyrite so much. Maybe in Drogmar you can advertise. But... Although I feel like if someone was like advertising a Skyrite, that would be pretty common actually in this world. No. We have been away from society for ages. We were like the last real like society place we've been in where we weren't like hiding and like doing a terrorism was Krebstadt as like a for the record thing that's how long ago it's been since we were last like in respectable society and not hiding You're the first person you've ever seen take that spell. The main thing is, when you hit the level where you can take any spell, regardless of spell school, is that you have to take counter spell. Not only because it's super powerful, but also because when you counter a spell, you can just go, No! You don't cast that. I have, the only time I've seen Skyrite used in like an actual play, it was a druid doing it because it, so it wasn't like taking up. It was just something they could learn that day. We need a fart noise for this for the stream deck so that like when the spell fails, it goes basically. Is that what your goal is? If not. would cast sign our illusion to make that noise. Well, the thing is, in D&D, they very specifically state that you can and should, like, give your spells flavor and skin, like, like, skin them, basically, like, give, modify them to match your character and how your character is. So, for example, when I use Fairy Fire, as a druid, I portray it as I am blowing glowing spores all over an area rather than just like, hey, here's some glowy stuff, right? And like your mage hand with your cat, your horrific mage hand. So 
Yeah, and we would need some variation in the fart noise this guy guys, right? So as per the rules, you should be able to have your um, counter spell be modified such that when it succeeds, it creates a little fart noise because it doesn't really affect the spell. It's purely a flavor thing. So it should be easily within the rules that it makes a little fart noise when it counters the spell. <laughs> yeah, and some hair noise rustling in the wind. That's true. Some fur. Excuse me. So yeah, you should be able to just have your counter spell make a fart noise and have that be totally okay. Because the game actively encourages that sort of thing. Right now the puppies are wondering why the cat is not interacting with them like a puppy. Pyrotechnics is the only other spell that you can really add flavor to. I mean, you can actually, you can add flavor to anything. So, like, with the the speak with dead spell, the way you cast it, like, maybe, like, you have to shake, like, a bone rattle or something. You know, like, <laughs> like, you can, you can skin anything. Like, you could theoretically... You could say, when I cast Vicious Mockery, like, there's like a sound wave effect that comes out of my mouth and like, assaults the target's ears. Things like that. As long as it's not, like, affecting the wording of the spell, you can pretty much make a spell look or sound however you want, as per the rules. And I think people should play with that more. Like, if you're a wizard and you're casting fireball, there's no reason you couldn't have that fireball be purple or green and make a big fart noise when it hits and explodes. Secret Dead Nine slaps the corpse and says, Wake up! <laughs> See, that actually is true. You, if you wanted, you could have Speak With Dead just be the verbal component as you yelling, Wake up! I need to talk to you! And the somatic component as you just like, Hitting the hitting the corpse a little, like 
Even just like nudging it like, come on, wake up. It's time to talk. Yeah, it wouldn't be annoying at all. To be fair, I mean, nothing Nines does is annoying. What other status ailments can I cast? Well, there's the blindness deafness spell. That would be... You could poison people, probably, somehow. Probably create exhaustion. Yeah, vicious mockery, killing people with depression. It's more, they just sort of like give up. They're like, I'm done fighting. I mean, it's not really. I suppose it's it's a bit temporary. That's the the key difference. Just forget cure wounds. Yeah, like, what are you even doing with that spell? Or I can just heal everyone, it's fine. I mean, you could have so many more fun spells where it's Taking a second. I feel like max level nine would take the wish spell and 
Just be like, I cast wish. Okay. What are you wishing? Potato. We're not level six yet, so you get counter charm, which will probably be more often. You'll probably use more often than you people would expect. Yeah, probably. Actually. Yeah, I get I mostly just get another spell and then I get a feature that lets us camp more safely. Which is nice. But not nothing too exciting at level five and six. For Soria. College of the Virtuoso get at level six. I can look it up big. Just searching for where I have that. Uh, you you do start to get the fame mechanic a little bit, I think, at level six, where the DM can choose for people to have heard of you. Um, actually, level six pretty powerful for you. So, um, one first you get advantage on performance check with instruments. So if you're doing performance with an instrument, you get advantage. Um, you can also when you are doing a performance in the middle of a performance you can use a standard action to cast a spell by as long as the spell has a verbal component yeah it is powerful um as long as the spell has a verbal component you can weave it into your instrument's performance um so you can continue performing while casting a spell as a standard action. 
so you weave your spells into your music. And then you also get minor fame. So as an RP thing, NPCs subject to the DM will might have heard of you and things you've done. So what that kind of means is that if you start playing like Dirge of Fear or Dirge of Dread or Call to Arms, you know, something like that, um, you can still cast standard action spells with verbal components while you play it, while you maintain the aura, as it were. So it, it's it's a pretty powerful level for you. And your instrument performances have advantage. be back after the restroom uh, as we hopefully kind of finish up Owen here who is coming together pretty nicely. I'm going to save it quick in case and then I'll be back in just a minute.
All right, I'm back. There we go. Quick. Quick little bathroom break for the puppies. All right. So all that's left is this bow here, and then I need to put some runes on the bow. Yes. Meanwhile, I am back, right? Okay. Good. This has some like lag. Just making sure. Alright. Yes. Meanwhile, well, well, I'm gone. Remember, raid shadow. Ah. <laughs> uh. This puppy potty break brought to you by Squarespace. Yes, yeah, so at level six, though, you get quite, quite powerful, uh, upgrade. Your bard levels are doing quite well for you at sort of the mid, mid level. I forget, do we get a feat at 6th level or as well? It's been too long since I've been above level 5. What was the advantage of perform? What was the F? Okay, so you get advantage on performance checks with instruments. And then you also get, um, you can, if you're giving a performance using your instrument, you can weave spells that have a verbal component into your instrument playing and cast. So without breaking a performance, you can cast, um, you can cast a, uh, wow, what am I trying to, a, as a standard action, you can cast a spell that takes a span standard action with a verbal component without breaking a performance by weaving it into your thing. So if you do your Dirge of Dread or your Call to Arms, you can continue to maintain that and still cast a standard action spell that involves that verbal component. So you can you can be buffing us and still use your vicious mockery or suggestion or any anything like that. Yeah. So you can you can do like call to arms more regularly without sort of nerfing your ability to do other stuff by this point. Yeah, exactly. So, I think level 6 is where the Virtuoso really starts to come into its own by adding that.
Because the basically it goes, hey, there's not really a good reason to not be buffing or debuffing the opponent. Buffing my allies or debuffing the opponent. Um because I can still I can still use spells some um, most of my spells in combat. Or out of combat. have to rely on debuffs to keep people alive. Yeah. But you could, you could theoretically be like, you know, uh, playing your instrument and like shoot magic missiles out of your loot. Yeah, you could be buffing us with a uh, call to arms and uh, be vicious mockery-ing simultaneously. So that would be, that would make you a, a veritable force on the battlefield. Yeah, that that's the downside. Uh, it it's a pretty powerful buff, but um, it it takes up everything, like all your your turn. So that's why it's sort of a situational use right now. But at level six, it opens up more, so you can much more freely be using it. Because it lets you still take other things. Now it lets you, it will let you do other actions in addition to it. <laughs> you want us when we're in town here, kinda to stack these glove and play the game and have Old Seth become a licensed to stack these judge. Yeah. That, that makes sense to do. Filling out with the crew in the backyard, find a shovel, never look good. Yeah, doing the whole Yu-Gi-Oh! GX uh, theme song. 
Get your stacks on. Come on now, better play your cats right. Okay, so here is Holen, I think, pretty much all set. So the next thing I'm going to do is add uh, magic runes to the bow as a separate layer. Oh, I think we're probably going to be making some sort of stupid business or similar thing when we get to Drogmara. Because we have a deed there, so we have to set some roots down. Pick some noble off of his property, I'm hoping. gonna do is uh make my brush small I think crab stack these would be easier to print than to stack in the real world. Grimmy delivers. We will. We have hired Sturm Grimmy and will deliver your mail from any body of water to any other body of water that you wish. stupid ideas. I, I'm pretty sure at one point Nine's like invested money in someone's business and I have no idea who, where, or when. I mean, I didn't write it down because it wasn't my not my investment. So when you say we didn't write it down, what you mean is you didn't write it down.
<laughs> Nine's the most hard to read, but not right. Probably. He just threw money at someone and told them to quit their job. <laughs> that that sounds about right. As well. And then he ghosted. I mean, this all this all tracks with it seems in character. I think I'll finish solo and just this magic and take very long. Well. And we might even have time to do something stupid.
Okay. Now what we need to do is um back. Inner. Making some I'm just doing some adjustment. Okay, there. This will do for Hall 1. We're getting some weird calls today. I'm gonna save. I'm gonna make. of this for availability for, for whatever we end up using this for.
I'm thinking I might make a gill boo boo boo. If I can find the, a good uh, picture I'd like to use. We'll see how how long this takes me, but we're going to step one: grab this picture I found of Gilbert Cup, right? And then we're gonna knock the opacity down. I'll add the white on the back, right? for sake of visibility. And then we will I have some I thought I had a picture of Kururu somewhere. to place drop this in quick all right so this is our target over here and this is our our base now. so what we need to do is make a new layer i can just have a uh, there and We're gonna go with black. So the very first step will be to uh, sort of get the lines face down so we know it's Gilbert Godfrey here. They're just going to trace trace over Gilbert Gottfried's face here. Right. Get our Gilbert face. Right, I have to go out here. 
bend the gear out a little. secret process. Alright. I have a bit of a face. I'm just taking a look, quick look at Kururu's hat here. Get a sense of what's going on. Uh, is important word. <laughs> this is, uh, yeah. This is the Cornet Gilburu. That is definitely something. Gilburu. Yeah, Galvuru lines do need to generally be in all caps, but this is a true statement. I'm just referring back to our uh, image here. Get a good sense of what's going on. Because uh, we have to get a screenshot when you're done. We have to go running. Alright, I will, I will post that later. 
We'll see. I don't want to spend an eternity on our guild boot. But, you know. Things have to happen for the sake of everyone. There's just a lot of tracing or something like this. I'm after some of the basics. not being very precise. You don't want to invest time on the hottest new thing on Twitch. And yeah, I mean, it is pretty overwhelming, isn't it? Like, super popular. Everyone is all about it. We are the number one Rhapsody stream often. Yeah, let's see how huh? it's looking. Pretty solid. Uh, we'll need right here. Just comparing to the actual Karuru picture. This is definitely worth going slightly over time for, isn't it? Alright, so now what we're gonna do eyedropper tool, grab a random chunk of purple. This important work.
I'm not going to do it like the most clean, well thought out way. Just doesn't work. I know that's what people want. Understand that this is super riveting too. Alright, the so next now we have this purple. Um we'll grab the blonde here and this gold. I, I, if you want to make that, go ahead. I don't know if I want to make that. I mean, I don't think, I don't know how you could sexualize Gilberu more than Gary. Seems about as sexual as accentuate it. Eh, that's fair. Okay, now we're gonna grab this pink. Grab this purple again. Huh? Yeah, puppies. I want to get the booger. Alright, now we need the dirt, which is the sort of cream white. And for that, we're going to actually hide the background so I can get a better sense of what's what's where.
this arm. Leave. Yeah. Not being very clean with these, but that is okay. Hey, hey. Right, now for the sash. Just leaves the skin tone. So I'll grab Gururu's skin color here. Not getting much gone.
And we're just gonna take the white of the shirt <laughs> to use for the eyeball. We'll take the pink from the hat part. Go a little bit. I would do that. And then we're gonna take a tiny bit of pink for blushing. That. And then we need. Um, to do the microphone, so I'm just gonna grab like a sort of grayish color. So there's our Karuru turned into a Gilbu. Oh, wings? Yeah, I forgot about wings. We're not doing wings. <laughs> I'm already 20 minutes over my time. So this is what this is what we're getting. There we go. There's our Gilbu room. I might add wings later, but for now, we're going to end the stream. So thank you everyone for watching. If you're watching on YouTube, um, do all the liking and subscribing and button pushing. If uh, you want to support our channel, you can go to patreon.com slash Dyson Dungeons. Um, and thanks for watching, everyone. I'm going to go take care of some puppies. Bye.